Welcome to Unit 3. Now we're going to look at, as you see on the screen, the equations and inequalities. We'll take all the information we learned from functions and their graphs and uh, everything else that's come previously in this course, and we'll put it all into the service of equations and inequalities of one variable. We'll stick to one variable because that's all we need to do in college algebra. So I guess we'll go ahead and get started. As we begin this unit, and I, you see that I have it carefully marked equations in one variable, the first thing we want to look at is what your graphing device can do for you and what makes it theoretically possible for that to be true. So the first topic we'll look at is solving equations approximately with a graphing device and the intermediate value theorem. Now that will be the theoretical underpinning for what the graphing device allows us to do. So on that note, let's go ahead and look at solving equations approximately. The first thing I want to do is make a few points before we get into complete detail. I want to make some general points. Again, the equations, I said this before, but let me say it again, it's worth mentioning. The equations are in one variable only. And as we saw even in the last unit, whenever you end up with an equation with more than one variable, you need to eliminate one of the variables in order to proceed. Secondly, if you can solve an equation exactly, if you can solve an equation exactly, well, do so. By all means, try and solve it exactly. However, if you cannot or if it turns out that solving it exactly would be tremendously difficult. And we'll see examples of that later. You want to try and use the graphing device to get to an approximate kind of solution. So, if not, a graphing device, any graphing device, whatever, can lead to an approximate solution. And frankly, in some cases, the only solution you can get is an approximate solution, whether you use a graphing device or some other numerical technique. So there are two types of solutions you can get, approximate solutions and exact solutions. We try for exactness. If we can't get exactness, we go for approximation. And you want to be clear on how each one works. Now, since we'll be doing approximations in this course, we ought to have an agreement on how approximate we want to be. So for the sake of this course, here is our agreement. We'll call this agreement on approximations. Now sometimes we'll alter this, but we'll say that specifically at that time. This agreement is in all other cases where it isn't mentioned. So when we approximate answers to problems, when we approximate, it will be, unless of course, as I said, we make a specific change. When we approximate, it will be correct, and what I'm going to mean by that is truncated, I'll explain that in a moment, correct to two decimal places. Now two decimal places is fine for us. It gives us enough accuracy for everything that we're going to do. If you're in other areas, you may want more decimal places. But if you can do two, you can do as many as you want. So this is a good round number for us to work with. Now, what does this mean? And in particular, what does this truncated mean, if you don't know? Well, here's what I mean by this. Meaning, OK, if, say, the exact answer to whatever it is you're working on, the exact answer is, say, 2.65819, then what do I mean by correct to two decimal places? Well, correct, or as I said above, truncated, and you'll see now why that is the correct word, truncated to two decimal places is 
2.65. What I have done is I have truncated. Truncate means cut off. I have cut this decimal off at the second place. I have not done any rounding. All I've done is cut it off. That is our agreement. All right, that's what we will do in this course. We will simply chop it off at the second decimal place. While, just to give you an, uh, an example of what happens when you don't truncate, if, you had, if we had rounded up, say, to two decimal places, that is 2.66. Now why is that? Well, 2.65, the next number is 8, so 5, 8 is closer to 6, 0 oh, than it is to 5, 0, oh, so we replace this with a 6. This would be rounded upward. We are not going to do that in this course, so we won't be rounding when we talk about finding something correct to two decimal places. We'll simply mean truncation. Okay, that's just a matter of convention for this course. And now, how would you actually get that degree of accuracy on your graphing device? Well, here's a nice way to see how you can. Sometimes it takes a little bit of work. In fact, it's usually better to try to find the exact answer and then approximate that with the calculator. But if you're trying to approximate from a graph, which may be the only way you can go, here's a way to think about it. Let's see, I've made a little table here for accuracy to these decimal places colon and we'll go all the way across here what we want to do is then once you know what decimal place you want you want to choose the appropriate X scale usually abbreviated that way on the calculators alright if you want it approximately to zero decimal places just to the nearest whole number approximation you choose x scale equal 1. Now, why, where does the 1 come from? Well, let me give you the background. This is 1 over 10 to the 0. Remember, anything to the 0 power is 1. Now, you might think this is a funny way to write 1, but it'll be the pattern that follows down below. So, you choose x scale equal 1. What does that mean? That means when you look at your graph, the scale will mark off and have tick marks only at the whole numbers in both directions. Okay, going off to infinity there. If you want accuracy to one decimal place, that is to say you want to choose x scale to be 0.1, the reason for that is that's 1 over 10 to the 1. Notice that the 0 here and the power 0 here match, the 1 here and the power 1 here match, that's where these come from. So you choose the x scale to be 1 tenth. So when you look at your calculator, the tick marks whether they're marked or not, will stand for 0, 1 tenth, 2 tenths, etc., and also in the other direction. So what's happened is the 0 to 1, or for example, well, part of this has been expanded. 0 to 1 now is expanded out that way. You're now going to a tenth of the size you were before. It gives you more accuracy. Once more, for accuracy to two decimal places. Two decimal places, remember, is what we're going to do in this course you would have an x scale of 0, 1, 0 0.01. And of course, that's the same thing as 1 over 10 squared, 1 one hundredth. And when you look at your scale on your calculator, it'll go from 0 to 0.01 to 0 0.02, etc. So it's like the tenths here have been expanded out. And now you're down to the point where if you know that your answer is in here, say, you know that it is 0 0.01 something. And if we're truncating, then 0 0.01 is the correct truncation. So, now this sometimes requires a triple process, where you look at the graph with scale 1, then you zoom in and look at scale 1 tenth, and then 1 one hundredth to finally get to the point where you can estimate from the graph the answer to two decimal places that have been truncated. Now that can be a little tedious, but if there is no other way to do it, it's cr really quite fast. Okay, now that we've said a few words about approximation, let's get back to the whole idea of solving equations. This is something that we actually mentioned back when we were doing basics, but I'm going to say it in a slightly different form now, since I have functional notation. Fact. 
all equations, I'm abbreviating again as I always do, all equations in one variable, say, just for the record here, x, can be written as follows. Can be written f of x equals 0. In other words, to make completely clear what's on the left, all non-zero terms, everything, all non-zero terms on the left. And what's on the right? Zero on the right. Now you can always do this. You can push everything to the left and leave zero on the right. Now with that in mind, I can write down certain facts about equations, assuming that they are in this standard form. So, the first fact I'd like to talk about is, how do you solve this? In other words, how do you find what x values make this zero? Well, let's talk about that. Solving f of x equals zero means well, in this course, by now, you've caught on that there are two ways to look at almost everything. One is the algebraic way, and one is the graphical way. Algebraically, what would solve this mean? Well, it, it's what I said a moment ago. It is finding x values. Well, what's an x value anyway? It's a number. Finding x values which make the statement f of x equals 0 true. So if you put in these x values for x, you get something that's true. You get 0 equals 0 is what you get. Graphically, what is the picture that goes along with this that we want to get used to? The picture is solving f of x equals 0 means, pictorially, finding x intercepts. Now remember what those are. Those are points of the form x comma 0. Because they intersect the x axis, their y value is nothing. It's 0. Finding x intercepts on the graph of the function y equals f of x. So what we've done in this case is we reinterpreted f of x equals 0 to mean take the function y equals f of x, set it equal to 0, find out where the y value is 0. Those are also called x-intercept points. So graphically, finding the x values which make the function, makes, make the equation true is the same thing as finding the x-intercepts on the graph of y equals f of x. And this is the key to linking these two the algebraic and the graphical ways of seeing things. So to fix that in your mind, let's do a couple of examples. We'll take them very simply, because we really haven't talked about solving such equations yet. But I think these are things that you've seen before. They're simple enough that we can figure out what's going on without too much extra technique. Solve 2x equals 6. Very easy looking problem. Let me go ahead and break the page up into two parts. Let me do the algebraic part first. And I have a couple of points to make here as we go too. Algebraically. Well, your first instinct is probably the following. Write down 2x equals 6. Divide both sides by 2. x equals 3. End of story. And that's perfectly fine. However, let me show you another way to think about this. And I'm going to say it's better. Now, it's not going to be better on this problem. It's not going to be simpler than what you've just done. There isn't anything simpler than this. However, in problems that get more complicated, this better way will save you from losing solutions and making other sorts of errors. The better way to think about this is to try and get back into that f of x equals 0 form we talked about a moment ago. So if I started with 2x equals 6, and I rewrote it as 2x minus 6 equals 0, pushing everything over to the left, then I have at this stage that f of x equals 0 form. Now, how can I solve this? 
Well, I notice on the left that 2 is common to 2x and 6, so I factor that out. 2 times x minus 3 is 0. Then when I look at this, I say the only way this product can be 0, since these are numbers, is if one or both of the numbers is 0. 2 can't be 0. x minus 3 must therefore be 0. That, you may recall, we called something like the zero product principle, or the zero product fact. And if x minus 3 equals 0, of course, x equals 3. We end up with the same answer, of course. But we followed a procedure, putting everything to the left and then using that zero product principle, which will hold us in good stead later. OK, algebraically, we found that the only solution here is 3. So let's see what happens when we look at this graphically. Graphically. Or again, I'll write down 2x equals 6. And again, I will push the 6 to the left. So I have 2x minus 6 equals 0. Except now I'm going to label the left-hand side. I'm going to head, go ahead and call it y. So this becomes an equation. But it's also a function. We can think of it as y equals 2x minus 6. This is an f of x, if you like. But we've seen these before. This is a line. It's the equation of a line, which we talked about earlier. It is also in that f of x equals 0 form here. And what we want to know, this is a line. And this equaling 0, we want to know where this line crosses the x-axis. So if we look at a picture, and I've gone ahead and worked this out, so I won't pull out the calculator for this. 1, 2, 3 here, and then 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So minus 6 is where it crosses here, and 3 is where it crosses here. And there is the line y equals 2x minus 6, the x and the y axes. This point is the point 3 comma 0. That means that x equals 3 is the solution. That is the x-intercept point, of course. And that, of course, agrees back here with the other one. We expected that. But this is a graphical way of looking at the problem. This says, solve the equation and don't really care what the picture is. This one says, look at 2x minus 6, remember it's a line, and graph it. Where it crosses the x-axis will give you an x point, that, uh, an x comma 0 point, and the x value will be the solution to the equation. So this is a very nice graphical way of seeing the solution to this algebraic equation. Let us solve x cubed is equal to 25x. So that's a cube there. All right, this is more complicated than doing a line. And you might say, well, I don't know how to solve cubics. Well, this cubic is easy enough that we can solve it even with what little we know at this point. Once again, let me split the page up into two parts. On the left, I'll do algebraically. And on the right, I'll do graphically. Now, algebraically, I'll do the same procedure as I did before, but now I have experience behind me. x cubed equal 25x. I will put everything on the left. x cubed minus 25x is 0. I immediately see that x can be factored out. So I'll pull that out, x squared minus 25. And now this is where your experience comes in. x squared minus 25 is the difference of two squares. You will recognize that from the work we did in basics. The difference of two squares factors very nicely. So this is x times x plus 5 times x minus 5 equals 0. Now we have three things multiplied together, all of them standing for numbers. That means that one or all of them, or any two of them, say, must be 0. So if x is 0, we get one solution. x can be 0. When x plus 5 is 0, we get another solution, minus 5. When x minus 5 is 0, we get another solution, x equals 5. And so this cubic of degree 3, you notice, has three real solutions. Now that was the algebraic technique. We pushed everything to the left to get f of x equals 0. And then we used some other facts from before. Difference of squares can be factored, and that zero product principle came up again. All right, that was the algebraic way of doing this. Once again, let's look at the graphical solution. 
Now doing these both ways in, in these first two examples may seem like a waste of effort because the algebraic solution here on the left is really not very difficult. But you have to remember there will be times where there is no easy algebraic solution or no algebraic solution at all. So the graphical solution on the right becomes the only way to go. So you want to practice this on these simple ones. x cubed equals 25x. Well, just as before, x cubed minus 25x equals 0, pushing everything to the left. And now I label this y, so this becomes a function of x that I will graph. And where that function equals 0, in other words, its x-intercepts, will be, I hope, these three points. Now, if we graph this, and I went ahead and did this already, as I said before, I won't run to the calculator on this one, we get a picture that looks roughly like this. Passes through these points. These points, as it turn out, turns out, are minus 5, 0, and 5. The x-axis and the y-axis. By the way, if you want to check this on your calculator, the window I'm using here is minus 6 to 6. That takes me just a little beyond the minus 5 and 5. And the y I had to do a little work with is minus 50 to 50. Now that's not essential to this problem, but I thought if you want to look at the picture, you can look at that yourself. These points correspond to minus 5, 0, the origin point, which is 0, 0, and the point here, which is 5, 0. And of course you see that then x is equal to minus 5 from there, 0 from here, or 5 from here. And of course, these are the same as what we got algebraically. So we can see that graphically where this curve x cubed minus 25x crosses the axis gives us the same answers, the same three x values as we had gotten algebraically. So you want to always look at an equation like this as an algebraic object and as a graphical object. The two different insights are very valuable. Now, why did these two examples work? There really was some theoretical mathematics here that I left out. Well, I want to be fair and tell you what those pieces are. We'll call them two facts, and these are two facts we used uh, in the examples. There are two facts that we really can't prove or demonstrate at this level of a course. But we can show you the idea, certainly, because the idea is, is elementary. First of all, we used what I'm going to call a working definition. I'll even put that in quotes. A working definition of continuous. And continuous is what, what is being defined here. I'll tell you why it has to be a working definition and not a strict, precise definition. Here's the definition we used without really giving much thought. A function y equals f of x is what we will call continuous if its graph contains no what you might call holes gaps, jumps, etc. whatever word makes you happy. The working definition of continuous that we will use is it is a function whose graph has no holes in it. Another way to say that colloquially is to say it's a graph you can draw without lifting your pen or pencil from the page. Now, to do this precisely, to precisely define this, calculus is required or at least the theory that is introduced in calculus. So calculus is required to make this precise. Because there are some mathematical subtleties here. But for our purposes in this course, this is a perfectly good definition. It is a continuous function if its graph has no holes in it. Now that's one of the two facts that we used in the examples. The other one is this one. It's, this one's called a theorem. This one's even called the Intermediate Value Theorem. We will not prove this theorem. 
but I think it seems like a theorem that you will look at and say, isn't that common sense? Well, it's common sense if you have the hypothesis of the theorem and you have a proof. For us, we'll just simply take it as a statement of fact. Intermediate value theorem. Now this is an example of what's called an existence theorem. It tells you that something is there. And it's an if-then statement, so it's a one-directional arrow. If f is continuous, now we can use continuous in our working definition sense, but this works with the actual precise definition of continuity. If f is continuous, if also a is less than b, so a and b are two numbers, and when you evaluate f at a and f at b, we're assuming a and b are in the domain of f, these two numbers have opposite plus or minus signs. If all of that happens, then, again, this is a one-directional theorem. If you have the hypothesis, then the conclusion follows. Then, the graph of f, well, say the graph of y equals f of x, has at least one. Now, this is the existence part I mentioned, existence. It, the graph of y equals f of x has at least one what? One x-intercept between a and b. Now I'll bring this statement back in a moment once we have the picture. Let me read it one more time. If you have a continuous function and a is less than b, and f of a and f of b have opposite plus or minus signs, so one of them's a positive number and one of them's a negative number, then the graph of the function, y equals f of x, has at least one x-intercept between those two numbers. Now you'll see from the picture that this is one of those theorems that's visually obvious. It turns out to be subtle to prove, but the picture I think is clear. The proof idea in a picture, and that's all we'll do in this course. The proof idea in a picture is the following. Let us suppose say, remember the hypothesis said that f of a and f of b had different plus or minus signs. Let's just suppose that f of a is the one that's less than zero and f of b is the one that's greater than zero. Doesn't matter which one, uh, but we'll just say this so I can draw a picture. All right, here's my picture. Here, say, is a. Here, say, is b. Let me mark that below. Then, let's say that this is where f of a is, so that's the height f of a. So this direction is f of a, and you can see from the picture that f of a is less than zero. It goes down. And let me put f of b up here. So this will be a height f of b up here. And so that would be f of b, and it is greater than zero. Those are the conditions. And the function f which goes from here to here is continuous. So if I draw a continuous function without lifting up my pen, I get a picture like that. It's visually obvious that it must cross the x-axis. At least one such x-intercept exists. It's clear you can't go from here to there without crossing the x-axis. Now that turns out to actually use a subtle property of the real numbers, but we won't go into that here. We'll just say it's visually obvious, so it seems like the theorem is true, and then we can use that fact. Now remember, too, that there may be more than one. This may be a function that crosses many times before getting to the top. So in that case, there'd be many places where it crosses. The theorem simply says there's at least one. This, this theorem justifies our use of graphing devices. Our use of graphing devices as we have used them above. That is to say, we look and see where the graph seems to cross the x-axis. We even use one of the buttons on the calculator and a menu item to find the x-intercept. And the number that it gives us, we can assume is a good approximation because we know that there is such a number there. 
And the theorem here says there is such. So this is just theoretical background. This says it is OK to do what we're going to do. So I won't need to talk about it again. And I said I'd bring the theorem back for a moment. You see, if f is continuous, a less than b, and f of a and f of b have opposite signs, it's clear that the graph has at least one intercept. So now you can read this theorem and remember the picture. OK, let me show you one example of how this might easily be used just to illustrate it in this simple case. Here's the problem. Show that the graph of f of x equals x to the fifth minus x cubed minus 1, a very high degree polynomial, fifth degree. We have no clue on how to solve this at this point. Show that that graph has, has an x-intercept between 1 and 2. You need not approximate it. So all I want to do is show that this x-intercept exists. I don't have to find it. I just need to show that it exists. Well, for my solution, I, since I don't know how to solve this algebraically, I'm going to go right ahead to my graphing device. And to do that, as you know, I have a the functional form here that I can enter into the calculator. I also know I want to look between 1 and 2. So that means my window should be 1, 2 for the x values. But I haven't got a clue about the y values. Now I can hunt. I can use experimentation. I can fiddle, as I've said before. I can also use auto scale or auto scale or zooming in an automatic fashion or whatever else your calculator allows you to do. Let's go ahead and look at the calculator now and see what I can do in this case. So let me turn this on and let me type in the function. So I'll have to go back here, and delete the previous one, clear that off, and I'll type in x to the fifth, this calculator types it in very nicely, minus x cubed, and then what did I have? Minus 1. And I can go to the window. I know that I need to be between 1 and 2. So for x min, I'll enter 1. x max, I'll enter 2. And as I said, I don't know what I need to do for my y max and y min. Well, I have to confess, I've actually worked this out before. But before I use the numbers that I came up with, let's go, go ahead and see what auto scale would do. Now, on my calculator, I have to go to the zoom key and then see there's a command that says auto. I'm going to hit enter. It's auto scaling. And remember what that does. I've given it an x value. So from 1 to 2 has been given. And then it will find the height, the y value that works best to show off every y value in the curve between 1 and 2. And this is what auto scale has given to me. Now, that's perfectly correct, and you can see uh, sort of toward the left there, that there's a place where it crosses the x-axis. It's a little bit hard to see because it flattens out. There isn't a nice crossing point. So with this in mind, I'm going to change the scale. I am going to change the scale based on, I, if you trace it, you can see where you need to go just beyond that point. Turns out you only need to go to 1. So y min minus 1, it looks good to me. Y max you see is 23. I'm going to change that to 1. That looks like a height that's good enough for me. And I make that change, and then I graph it again. Now I like this picture better. It is exactly the same function. But notice that the crossing is less flat. It's not parallel to the x-axis. It really looks like it's closer to being vertical, and so it's easier to see. Now, you can use trace to move over there and find the x-intercept. Or if you have a command, like I do, take you to that menu. You come over here to intersect. No, what I want is x-intercept. And I hit Enter. It says it's calculating. And then it will give me the coordinates of that point. Now, I don't need the coordinates of that point for this problem, do I? You notice that it is x. x is about 1.23. Remember, the problem only asked to show that there exists a solution, a number, an x-intercept in the interval 0, 1 to 2. The fact that I know it's about 1.23 did not matter in this problem. 
But I thought that since we were here, I'd show you how to go ahead and do that once again. So let's go back to the pad. And on the pad, I go ahead and draw the picture. Because every time you do one of these for homework or for any kind of problem set, you have to produce the picture that is on the screen. Now the picture I had at the end there, where I went from, uh, let's see, 1 to 2 in the x direction, and then minus 1 to 1 in the y direction. And that point there, I discovered, was approximately 1.23, even though I didn't need that for the problem. In this problem, all I needed to know is that such a point exists, and so it does from the picture. OK. Well, that was a simple example. And I didn't have to get an approximation. Let's do one where the point is to get an approximation and show you how you might go through the procedure on the graphing calculator. That is to move from 0 to 1 to 2 decimal place accuracy. Since this is a little bit new, I'm going to walk through an example like this in as much detail as I need. So here's the example I want to look at. And let me just cover this bottom part up for a moment. What I want to do is approximate the smaller of the two solutions of x squared minus 6x plus 7 equals 0. Now, there must be two solutions. And so we want to look at the smaller one, the one that will be furthest left in the picture. And I want to approximate that correct to two decimal places. Now, all I've done here at the bottom is I've written out that the solutions of this equation are the x-intercepts of f of x equals the function, x squared minus 6x plus 7. So that's something we've already discussed. The equation and the x-intercepts, the solutions to the equation and the x-intercepts coincide. Now, with that in mind, let's see what you can do with this. We'll pause now, and then when we come back, I'll show you how I attacked it. Now on to the solution. What I will do here is use my graphing device, of course. And I will enter the function. And the function is uh, x squared minus 6x plus 7. And what I will do here uh, as I go on, I will write out what I'm going to do. And then I'll go to the calculator and show you how it works. But I want to give you the outline first. So I'll enter the function. I will start with my x scale being equal to 1, as recommended earlier. I will experiment. Now, I've already done this experiment to find a window. And the window that I will find is minus 1, 7 and minus 2, 8. So that's my x and y. Now, later on, we'll have more of a technique, especially for equations or functions like this. We can actually do a much better job of picking a window without guessing. All right. We will then have a graph on the screen where the x scale is 1. I will then use the zoom box commands. Everyone has a zoom key on their calculator. And I will zoom box around the smaller solution because that's what I was asked to do, find the approximate smaller solution. Then once I've done that, and I will have a new picture, then I will change to a better x scale, a finer x scale, x scale equal 0.1. Then I will repeat that process, repeat, and end with x scale equal 0.01. So that is the finest, and that will give me very easily the solution I'm looking for uh, to two decimal places, which is what I wanted to get to. So let me keep that there and bring it back in a moment. But now I'm going to go to the calculator. Here's the calculator. And you can see that I've already entered the x squared minus 6x plus 7 up there at the top. And let's go hit the window here. And you can see that the minimum is already set to minus 1, the maximum to 7, the scale set to 1, the minimum y value is set to minus 2, the maximum y value is set to 8. And I don't care about the y scale, so I'll just leave it at 1. Now let's see what kind of graph I get here. 
Now here's the graph of the function coming down. And it is a quadratic, it's a parabola, and it's striking twice as we expected from our results. And the uh, question in this problem was to approximate the smaller of the two roots. Now that, of course, is the one to the left. So to do that, I'm going to do, follow the procedure I recommended so that you can practice this. I'm going to do what's called zoom box. So I hit my zoom key. You'll have a zoom key somewhere. And on mine, box is the second thing. So I'll go to zoom box and hit enter. Now, you see that nothing's really happened on the screen except that there's a cursor suddenly appeared in the center. And it, uh, the reflection of what, that cursor, what position that cursor is at is on the bottom. You can see the x and the y values are indicated down here. But that doesn't matter to me. What I'm going to do is move my cursor over till I get close to the lower root, the smaller root. Now that looks pretty good to me. Now what am I trying to do here? I'm trying to create a box around this smaller root that I will then zoom in on. So now that I'm in the zoom box mode, if I hit enter, of course you don't see anything, but what's happened is that there has been a point placed on the screen right behind the cursor. If I move the cursor downward now, the cursor you see is drawing a line behind it. And if I go over to the left, it's creating a box. And I can tighten that box up by going back up a little bit. And now I'm happy. It is a box that encloses where the second root is, where the uh, curve has an x-intercept on the x-axis. So now if I hit enter, the screen will zoom in onto what is inside that box. So here I go, hitting enter. Now this is what was inside the box. It is now filling the screen. Having done this once, I go back to window and immediately change my scale now to 0.1, which is finer than the one scale, and then go back to the graph. So there's the graph. And you can see that it's striking between a couple of tick marks. But that's not going to help me because the scale is 0.1, and I want to get down to a resolution of 0.01. So I'm going to pre repeat the same process I did before. Here's zoom. Go over to box. Hit enter. And then come on up here to somewhere near the root. It doesn't matter where exactly. Say there. I hit enter to pin the uh, point behind the cursor to the screen. Then I go over to the right. And you see it's drawing a line. And then I go down. And I have encompassed the root. I can go a little further to the right if I want. And the root is entirely within the box. So now I hit Enter, and the screen zooms in on that root. And then the first thing I will do is change the scale now to 0.01, which is the finest scale that I want, 0.01. Enter, and then go back to the graph. And now the tick marks are 0.01 apart. So now I know that whatever the coordinates of the curve are, and let me, there's my cursor. All I have to do is pass the tick mark, the first tick mark there that the line is going between. And you see that x says 1.58. The next tick mark will make it 5.9. 5.8 is where I stop if I want to get, truncate this at 2. And so I'm finished. So from here, we'll go back to the pad. All right, this is the, these are the directions I gave you before. And now, here is the last window. This is the last window that was on the screen. Go ahead and draw that here. Now, this is the kind of thing you'll be doing when you do calculations. The last window. There were a bunch of tick marks, but I noticed that the curve looked something like that, and that this tick mark stood for 1.58. Now that is going to be the x-intercept, of course. x-intercept, and that is approximately 1.58. There we go. And that is truncated, that is cut, as we said we would do, after the second decimal place. I might also note here that the curve, when I zoomed in this far, looks almost like a straight line. And that, in fact, is a very important property of continuous functions. If you zoom in far enough, they will appear to be straight lines. With that in mind, one can develop calculus. So that is an observation worth remembering. But I wanted to show you that just to give you an idea of how this works.
Uh, let me give you one final note while we're here talking about the calculator. So a final note that if the x-intercept, after you've done all of that, the x-intercept appears to lie on a tick mark number, a tick mark number, then I would recommend that you try that number in your equation f of x equals zero. Because if it works, you've found an exact solution. And an exact solution is always nice to have. So that's just a little tip while we're there. Okay, well let's go ahead and pause now and we'll come back to another segment. Now we're going to continue. We've looked at solving equations approximately just to get our approximation uh, juices moving. And now we're going to go ahead and start looking at equations in particular types. So let's first look at solving linear equations. And under this category, I, I've also written something called the linear formula, which I'll explain, or by graphing. So let's see what I mean by all of this. So solving linear equations, and remember we're doing this in one variable. All right, let's recall, first of all, a linear function. Now this was a function that came in when we talked about the library of functions back under functions. This is a linear function, is the name that was given to it. It looks like this, it's f of x equals ax plus b. So that was the form. And if you remember, the a stood for slope. Actually, we used m in those cases, but now we're going to use a. And of course, this is a function. We want to get to the point where we talk about equations. Don't worry, we will get there. This can also be called, and th these are words I'm trying to prepare you for uh, the use of later. This is a polynomial function of degree one, because that's the highest power of the x in this particular function. And uh, all right. So with that in mind, let's go ahead and define what a linear equation would be. Definition. A linear equation, now one thing you should remember is an equation is a mathematical sentence. A function, for example, is a mathematical noun or pronoun. So when we're talking about an equation, we're talking about a sentence with an equal sign in it. A linear equation in one variable, and one can call this, if you like, a degree one equation in standard form. Now remember, standard form in mathematics is very important in order to read things off and to have certain formulas work. In standard form is going to be ax plus b equals zero. Now you remember that's in that familiar f of x equals zero form that I said was going to be helpful. That's what we have here, an f of x on the left equals zero. Now in order for this to be meaningful, just for the record, we assume that a is not zero, because if a is zero we just have a constant here and there's only one constant that equals zero, that's zero, so a better not be zero. And otherwise, the a and the b are real numbers. So we are not talking about the situation where they might be complex numbers. For us, they are simply real numbers. Okay, well that's the definition of a linear equation. Let's go ahead and do a little derivation here. Now this is an algebraic derivation. Of course, I'm doing this with algebra. And let me show you where it leads and then what we'll call it. Suppose you start with ax plus b equals zero. Then we could rewrite that as ax equals minus b, moving the b over to the right. We can then divide by a because remember we took a not to be zero, so x would be equal to minus b over a. This, if you like, you could call the linear formula. 
Now, depending on your experience, you may have heard of something called the quadratic formula. Well, this is the analog of that for linear equations. This is the linear formula. Now, you may not have heard of the linear formula before, and I'm going to tell you why that's true in a moment. Now, the linear formula, of course, gives you one solution. There is only one solution to a linear equation. Now, why haven't you heard of this before? Well, because it is not nearly as useful as the quadratic formula is. Not nearly as useful as other formulas we'll see. Now, why would that be? Well, because frankly, linear equations are so easy to solve that having a formula is not much of an improvement. And remember, to use this formula, we would have to be able to start out with the linear equation in this standard form. And frankly, most of them don't start out that way, and they're not worth getting into that form. So although this is technically correct, it is the linear formula, it is not all that helpful. Let me go ahead and point out what the graphical solution would look like here in a sort of generic way. The graphical solution, remember what you're given. You're given ax plus b equals 0, that equation. Now what you want to do is reinterpret this as f of x equals ax plus b and ask when will that be 0. Well, that's asking when this y value f of x is 0. In other words, we're asking for x-intercepts. Find x-intercepts. That is to say where this crosses the x-axis. So if you think of this as a generic example, if this is the x and the y-axis, then the equation of a linear, uh, or a linear function has an equation that is a line. And whatever this point is would be the x-solution. Well, let's see, that, that would be the solution, and that would correspond to x-intercept. So generically, that's what you'd have if this function, this linear function, is graphed. Again, since there is only one solution and everything is so simple to do algebraically, people do not usually solve this graphically. They use the graphical picture for confirmation only. Well, let's go ahead and get into one now. Let's go ahead and solve for p. Ah, new letter. Instead of x, we'll be solving for p. Here is the equation we're looking at. 1 half times p plus 5 minus 3 equals, there's the equation part. It's got to have an equal in it. 1 third times 2p minus 1. There is a linear equation. It's linear because it has a variable p that is taken only to the power 1. And I'll jump right in with the solution here. Well, there are some things here that occur often enough that it's worthwhile mentioning. First of all, first we want to simplify. Always a good thing to do because the ideal simplification will give you the answer. Of course, usually you can't simplify all in one blow like that, but that's the basic idea. First, we want to simplify. My advice in this case, an advice that occurs, a piece of advice that's used quite a bit, is to do what's called clear out the fractions. Of course, these are numerical fractions, fractions with numbers in them. Clear out the fractions by multiplying by 2 times 3 equals 6. Because you see the fractions have denominators 2 and 3. And multiplying them together gives me a number that I can multiply the whole equation by to eliminate those fractions. And that's exactly what I'm going to do now. So I'm going to take that multiplier 6, and I'll multiply it by the left-hand side, being careful to rewrite the whole thing just as it stands. So that's 1 half p plus 5 minus 3, that will be equal to 6 times, the same thing on the right, 1 third times 2p minus 1. All right, now we multiply it through doing the operation that we designed it to do. 6 times a half will leave me with 3. 
So 3 times p plus 5 minus the 6, of course, must also multiply by the 3. So that's 18. The 6 times the 3 here gives me 2 by design times 2p minus 1. Well, I can simplify further by multiplying all these parentheses out. So I have 3p plus 15 minus 18 is equal to 4p minus 2. Now I'm solving for p, so I want to get, ideally, p equals a number at the end of the problem. So I want to pull all of my p's together. So I'm going to move my 3p over to the right, in other words, subtract 3p from both sides. And I'll go ahead, since I'm pulling the p's to the right, I'll go ahead and pull my constant minus 2 over to the left. So what will I end up with? Well, I'll have the 15 minus 18, which I had before. The minus 2 has been moved over, that's now plus 2. Then 4p minus 3p, of course, is just p. And then, if I reverse these, because I prefer to have the p on my left, just by convention, and see what I have, 15 minus 18 is minus 3, plus 2 is equal to minus 1. Lo and behold, I have a solution. Let me point out two notes about this. First note, this solution is p equal minus 1, a very nice integer. Please don't expect that all your answers are going to be integers. That doesn't have to be the case. Secondly, I never did, if you look through all of the various versions of the equations here, all these equivalent equations, at no point did I actually have ax plus b equals zero, that form. As I warned you earlier, it usually will not turn up in problems because linear equations are so easy to solve. All right. Now, there's one other thing one needs to do in these kinds of equations, and it's a practice that you will sometimes drop out, but very often need to do, especially in more difficult equations coming up. You need to check your answer. And how do you check if a solution is really a solution? You check it in the original equation. That means you take your number, you substitute it in. The original equation, let me rewrite it, was 1 half p plus 5 minus 3 equals 1 third times 2p minus 1. If your solution, p equals minus 1, is really correct, it should fit into that equation and give you equality. Let's see if it does. 1 half minus 1 plus 5 minus 3 equals 1 third 2 times a minus 1, minus 1. And let's go ahead and simplify this. The minus 1 plus 5 in here is 4. 1 half plus 5 is 2. So we have 2 minus 3 there. Inside here we have a minus 2 and a minus 1 that's minus 3 times 1 third is minus 1. So we get minus 1 equals minus 1. And yes, that is true. So that means this number p equals minus 1 actually does work in the original equation. It solves the original equation. It makes the original equation into a true statement. All right. Let's do another example. And let's pick one with harder non-integer coefficients. Here's one. Solve for x, going back to our favorite variable. 2.78x plus 2 over 17.931 equals 54.06. And I want to solve it correct to two decimal places. As we saw in the last segment, that is truncation to two decimal places. All right. There's the problem. Let's look at it for a moment. 2.78, not an integer, times x plus 2 over 17.931, awful looking fraction, equals 54.06, another non-integer. And then the answer we get, by saying correct to two decimal places, it means find an approximate solution. Now we're going to need to know how to deal with that. Let me give you a tip before I start solving this problem that you will find useful, I hope, later on also. Tip. In these sorts of problems where you're trying to solve a something approximately, Solve for x, and another way to say that is to say isolate x. That's another phrase that's often used. Before, definitely before approximating anything.
In other words, do all the algebra you can before introducing the calculator to approximate anything. This will avoid cumulative errors. Every time you approximate, you enter an error into the problem. If you approximate several times, you've entered several errors. Those errors can accumulate and give you a wrong answer. So the moral is solve for x entirely algebraically, and then, then and only then, once in every given problem, then substitute it in your calculator and try to find an approximation. So let me show how that would work in this case. Solution. Here's the original equation. Let me write it out one more time for you. 2 over 17.931 equals 54.06. Then 2.78x. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take this number, the 2 over 17.931, and move it to the right by subtraction, of course. So 2.78x is going to be 54.06 minus 2 over 17.931. I will not attempt to simplify this at all. Then I will solve for x by dividing by 2.78. So x will be 1 over 2.78 times 54.06 minus 2 over 17.931. You might say that doesn't look very pretty, and you're absolutely right, it doesn't. However, I have introduced no errors at this point. I've simply algebraically reorganized the equation so that I have x alone and everything over here. Now what I want to do is approximate this, calculate it approximately to correct to two decimal places. How will I do that? Well I will enter it in my calculator. I'm going to have x then approximately equal to some number. But since I wanted to show you how this works, let's go to the calculator. So now I'm going to move the pad and we're going to go to the calculator and once on the calculator, we will go ahead and look at an actual calculation here. So I'll turn this on and I go to my calculation screen. And on my calculation screen, I will see if I can enter these numbers. And this calculator allows me to do some nice things, so I'll go ahead and show it to you. One over 2.78, and you see this calculator allows me to write it the way I would enter it on paper. Times parentheses, 54.06 minus 2 over 17.931, and then I'll go to the right and put another parentheses. So that's exactly what I had on the screen. You can see over to the left, the 2.78's a little bit has disappeared, but it's really still there. Now I will hit enter and I got out 9.40 something. I'm going to cut it off after the second decimal place, or sorry, 19.40, and so that would be the number that I use. So now I'll use, I'll go back to the pad, and I'll go ahead and show you the number we just got. The number was 19.40, and that was truncated. That was cut off after the second decimal place. And that's the approximation we were looking for. So there we are. So when you do this on the calculator, it's really quite nice. Just remember to do it at most once so you don't introduce errors that you really don't want to do. Okay, now we're not done with this problem yet. Very important thing we need to do in this, and I need to show you why it works out the way it does. We need to check our answer. So, check. The first thing I will do is give you a warning about checking in this kind of a, an approximation problem. Warning. Checking an approximate solution will only yield, of course, an approximate equation. So when you check your approximate number in the equation, you will only get an approximate equality because you're using a number that is not, in fact, correct. It's an approximation. So here's the check, the actual check down here. 2.78, and remember that's where x was, so it'll be 19.40 that I substitute, 
plus 2 over 17.931 equals question mark 5406.06. Now I'd like this on the left to be exactly equal to 5406. I'm going to substitute this now in my calculator. And I'm not going to show you, I'll just go ahead and write down what I got. When I did this, my calculator truncating again after the second decimal gave me 54.04. Now that's only approximately 54.06. It's not equal. But then, if we wanted an approximate answer, we should expect that that's what we'll get here, is an approximate equation in approximate equality. And that's the best you can do. If it is reasonably close, you should be happy with the approximation you gave. Of course, if these are very far apart, then you probably have made an error earlier. But be aware that you will get approximate solutions here. So, with these examples behind us, let me write up a summary for you and then you'll have a chance to try some problems on your own. Here's a summary of some of the aspects to solving linear equations in one variable. And the variable, of course, we're using here is x, but it can be any letter. So, first thing, if needed, Clear fractions. That happens often enough, so it's worthwhile putting down. Secondly, simplify. Simplify each side. Now, what does simplify mean? Well, it means things like multiply out parentheses. I can't list every possible thing, but I'll give you some ideas. I'll multiply out parentheses, combine like terms. etc. The sorts of standard algebraic simplifications that you do. Then, once you've got everything as simple as you can on each side, you want to start working side to side so that you can isolate the variable. And I say I call it x here, to get an expression that looks like this. x equals, here's a technical term, stuff. Okay? That's the idea. X equals stuff, stuff without X in it. Okay? Numbers. The next thing you can do, if you desire it, you can approximate, if desired. If you don't like the way the answer looks and you want an approximation. And then finally, you want to check. Check your solution, and you always check your solution in the original equation. I stress this because there are many equivalent equations along the line. When you solve the original equation, you have a whole series of equivalent equations. Your check must be in the original. And as we'll see later, you will find out that by doing algebra and solving a given equation, you can end up with candidate solutions that do not solve the original equation. So we have to be very careful to check these things. Okay. Well, why don't we go ahead and pause, and you can try this summary of material out yourself on solving linear equations in one variable. Now we've looked at solving linear equations. Sometimes there are nonlinear equations that can be reduced to linear equations after a step or two. And so they're worth mentioning here. So let's go ahead and look at those for a moment, solving nonlinear equations that lead to linear equations. So, what I will do is do this by example. So we'll just start out with an example here. All right. Here's the example. 2y plus 1 times y minus 1 equals y plus 5 times, say, 2y minus 5. Now, if you look at this, at first glance, it is definitely nonlinear. Why? Because if you think about it, on the left, you are going to have a 2y times y in here, which gives you 2y squared, and that's degree 2. 
that also occurs on the left, on, on the right. So on both sides you have, two, you have a y squared occurring, and so this is a degree 2 equation. It's not linear. However, after a step or two, it reduces to linear. So really, it's nonlinear in form, but linear in practice. So here's what we can do with the solution. We will multiply both sides out. How do we do that? Well, you need to remember what we did in basics on how to multiply binomials. I'm going to take the 2y here and multiply it by the y in the second binomial and by the minus 1 there. So I will end up with 2y squared and minus 2y. Then I'll take the 1 and multiply it by the y, and the 1 and multiply it by minus 1. Of course, y, 1 doesn't change anything, so this will be plus y minus 1. I do the same thing over here, the y times 2y and the y times minus 5. So I have 2y squared minus 5y. And then the 5 times 2y, which gives me 10y. And then the 5 times minus 5, which gives me minus 25. So. There we have everything multiplied out, and you see what happens with these squared terms. Notice you have 2y squared here, 2y squared here. If I subtract those from both sides, I have made them disappear, and there is no longer a problem that is nonlinear. This is now a legitimate linear equation. All right, well, let's start simplifying some things here. The minus 2y and the y give me minus y minus 1 equals the minus 5y and the 10y give me 5y minus 25. And I'm going to need to move things around here, so let me move to another page. Let me bring that last part up here so you can see that last bit. What I will do here is I want to combine the y's on one side. So what I'll do is bring the minus y over to here. Of course, I'm subtracting minus y, in other words, adding y to both sides. So that will leave me on this side with a 6y. And on the other side, I'll bring the 25 over to the other side. So that'll be 25 over here minus 1 is 24. So I have 24 equals 6y. Of course, that means y is equal to 4. And that is what I think is the correct solution. I will check to make sure if I put it in the original, 2 times 4 plus 1 times 4 minus 1 equals question mark. Always put a question mark at first because you don't know if this is going to work out. Equals 4 plus 5 times 2 times 4 minus 5. So I've gone through the original. I replaced the y everywhere by the 4. If I then simplify this, 2 times 4 is 8, plus 1 is 9, times 4 minus 1, which is 3, question mark. 4 plus 5 is 9, and then here I have 2 times 4, that's 8, minus 5 is 3. Is 9 times 3 equal 9 times 3? Sure it is. So that means that that number I found, y equals 4, is indeed a solution. So that original equation that appeared to be nonlinear was in fact linear. Let me show you another one like that. 3 over x minus 2 equals 1 over x minus 1 plus 7 over x minus 1 times x minus 2. Not only is this nonlinear, it's not even a polynomial equation. It's a rational equation. So how could this possibly turn into something that's linear? Well, let's see. First of all, as always in these rational expressions, the first thing you need to do is find out where these denominators would be zero, because those are numbers that are not allowed as solutions. So first I will write down that the domain of x equals the set of all the x's in the, uh, in the real numbers, and that's that set builder notation I've used before, such that x is not equal to 2, because that would make these x minus 2's go to zero, and it's not equal to 1, because that would make the x minus 1's go to 0. And either one of those going to 0 would cause division by 0, which we won't allow. All right. Then, having noted the domain, 
clear of, in this case, their variable fractions, but the principle is the same, clear of fractions by multiplying by, let's see, x minus 1 times x minus 2. Those are the, the, those are the only factors that occur in the denominator. So if we multiply through by this, we'll get everything to cancel out. So let's go ahead and see what that works out to be. So we're multiplying x minus 1 times x minus 2 times the original left-hand side was 3 over x minus 2. Now that is equal to x minus 1 times x minus 2 times 1 over x minus 1 plus the rest of that side, 7 over x minus 1 times x minus 2. So let's work this out. In the first expression here, on the left hand side, we see there's an x minus 2 on top and an x minus 2 on bottom. Of course that makes that 1, which is another way of saying they cancel. So what we're left with is 3 times x minus 1. I reversed the order of the 3 and the x minus 1, but it's still the same thing. Over here, x minus 1 times x minus 2 times the first term, the x minus 1 over x minus 1 cancels. But do not get in the habit. You've noticed that I have, I'm trying to avoid writing slashes when I cancel things. I didn't write anything here. I'm trying to avoid that because in cases like this, it is mistaken to do so. The x minus 1 indeed cancels with this. But this entire term here needs to multiply by the second one. And you don't, this x minus 1 being gone here doesn't mean it's gone for the second one. So multiplying times the first one leaves us with simply x minus 2 plus here the x minus 1, x minus 2 cancels entirely with the denominator, leaving us simply with 7. And let me note here that we have finally reached the stage where this is now linear. Everything up to this case was nonlinear, it's suddenly reduced to linear. So, if we multiply this out, we have 3x minus 3 equals x plus 5, minus 2 and 7 is 5. We move the x over to here, say, to get 2x, the minus 3 over there to get 8. x equals 4 is the apparent solution. This is not one of the numbers that we omitted in our domain. Remember we said the domain consisted of x not equal to 2 or 1. 4 is so certainly not 2 or 1, so that is indeed a legitimate solution. And now I'm reaching the point where I'm going to leave the check to you. So I'll say left to you, abbreviating as L to Y. So I'm leaving the check left to you in this problem. All right. Well, having seen that and having seen the rest of the work we've done, let me pose one to you. Actually, I already have it written out. Let me bring this up to you here and pose it to you. Here is the problem I'm posing. Solve for x. 3x over x minus 2 equals 1 plus 6 over x minus 2. Now you take some time to work on this and when we come back I'll show you what I would have done. Okay. Let's see what I'm going to do. Solution. Well, of course, you know the first thing I need to indicate is the domain of that variable x. So it'll be all the x's in the real numbers such that what? Well, there's only one denominator here, x minus 2, so I don't want x to be 2. So x not equal to 2. All right, with that in mind, I will multiply by x minus 2, that's to clear the fractions. So let me show you the work there. x minus 2 times 3x over x minus 2 equals x minus 2 times 1 plus 6 over x minus 2. Okay, well this is simple enough. I should be able to slip this in down here at the bottom. x minus 2, x minus 2 leaves me with 3x on that side. The x minus 2 multiplies by the 1 gives me x minus 2 plus x minus 2 again will cancel with the x minus 2 here and give me 6. So let me move to another page. 
And I now have, let me repeat that so I can work with it, 3x equals x minus 2 plus 6. So that's 3x is equal to x plus 4. And of course, I can then move the x over here and get 2x equals 4. And so x equals 2. Now, I'm done, right? I have found the solution, x equals 2. But wait a minute. Let me go back here. Let's see. The domain of x, x can't be equal to 2. But I found that the only solution possible is 2. What do I conclude from this? Do I conclude that I made a mistake? Well, usually that's a good idea to check. But in this case, I'll assure you, no, I didn't make a mistake. I will say, since 2 is not in the domain of x, the original equation has no solution. In other words, this is not a solution. Now that should not be a surprise to anyone. There is no reason on earth that every equation ought to have a solution just because we can write it down. This equation that we had originally here, the 3x over x minus 2 equal 1 plus 6 over x minus 2, simply states something that is impossible in the real numbers. That's all. So when you solve it, you end up confirming that by finding a number that is impossible in the domain. So, it's time for you to try a few of these nonlinear type problems and reduce them to linear problems.